we begin tonight with a pair of questions from the Lord Jesus and a pair of questions from the Apostle Paul. Jesus asked these questions back to back. For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? And the Apostle Paul, he followed up with this pair of questions to the church in Thessalonica. For what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? Are not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? Powerful pairs of questions. Jesus told us emphatically that one soul, one man or woman, one boy or girl, just one person saved is worth more than the entire world. And Paul echoed Jesus when he declared that his greatest joy and reward in heaven would be the souls, the men and women, the boys and girls, the people that he had seen saved through the power of the gospel. Yes, seeing just one soul get to heaven as a result of your efforts is worth much more than anything else you could ever accomplish or imagine here on earth. And that's why Jesus told his disciples that preaching the gospel must be their primary responsibility. Every individual disciple, not just the church corporate, but every individual disciple is commanded to be a witness, commanded to be the salt of the earth, commanded to be the light of the world within their own personal sphere of influence. Because brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, you will never know just how much impact your one life can have on the world around you. The Jewish Talmud summarizes this principle very succinctly and beautifully when it records these words. Whoever saves one life saves the world entire. Yes, one soul is worth more than anything you can see, touch, own, sell, or buy here on this planet called Earth. There are moments in history when ordinary people just like you and me are confronted by choices so stark that they either have to take risks or turn away. In 1938, it became crystal clear that the Jewish people in Europe had been marked for extinction by the Nazis. And all around the world, in country after country, capital after capital, people began to be aware and they came to know this shocking truth. And all across the world, people did what most of us do. They turned the page of the newspaper. They took another sip of coffee. They shook their head at the tragedy of it all. And they did nothing. But one young man named Nicholas Winton, a 29-year-old stockbroker from England, he decided that he had to do something. So young Nicholas, he canceled a planned skiing holiday and he went to the city of Prague, Czechoslovakia, just to investigate the dire situation for himself. The Nazis had initiated a campaign of persecution against the Jewish population in every occupied territory, everywhere the Nazis controlled they'd begun this campaign of persecution and elimination. Multitudes were already being sent to concentration camps. Time was literally running out for the Jews in Prague, especially for thousands of helpless little children 
innocently caught up in the conflict. And all across the world, people did what most of us do. They turned the page of the newspaper. They took another sip of coffee. They shook their heads at the tragedy of it all. And they did nothing. But Nicholas went to Prague and he set up a makeshift office in a hotel. He put an ad in the newspaper. And within two days, more than 2,000 parents had come to meet him. Since the borders of the countries all around them were closed to any kind of refugees, the adults were not allowed to flee. But they begged Nicholas, please just get our kids out of the country before the Nazis invade Czechoslovakia. He had no position, no power, no clout. All he could do was write the children's names on a list. And that he did. He extended the time that would have been spent on his skiing vacation. He extended his vacation for three weeks in order to collect as many names as possible. Back home, the British government would only allow children to enter into the United Kingdom if each child was matched to a host family who would agree to care for them until they turned 18. And each child also had to have a financial guarantee as well so that the government of the UK would not bear that burden. To arrange that, was a Herculean task. But Nicholas Winton worked tirelessly for months with only a small handful of volunteers. And somehow, because of the passion in his voice, because of the burden in his heart, he somehow persuaded host families to accept and adopt these Jewish children. He raised funds for their support all through the United Kingdom. And finally, Nicholas Winton arranged trains to transport them, all of these kids, hundreds of them, from Nazi-occupied Prague to the city of London. Over the first nine months of 1939, Nicholas was able to organize eight trains to carry these precious Jewish children to freedom. But thousands of other Jewish children all across Europe, they were not nearly so fortunate and they perished in the concentration camps. It broke Nicholas' heart that the last, the ninth train that he was able to organize containing 250 children, it never got to leave Prague as scheduled on September the 1st, 1939, because Hitler invaded Poland that same day and the Second World War broke out and none of those children were ever heard from again. After the war, the children of Nicola, that were rescued by Nicholas Winton, those kids would learn that nearly all of their parents had been killed in the concentration camps. You see, of the six million Jews that perished in the Holocaust, over one million of them were children. But because of Nicholas Winton, 669 children had been given a chance to live. They had survived to grow up and get married and have children of their own. And it was all because of one man one life, all because of one person who refused to sit on the sidelines and decided to get involved. I came across Nicholas Winton's story for the first time. I don't know how I missed it. For the very first time on Boxing Day, I was just doing some reading. And it was so amazing and moving to me. And one of the most moving things about Nicholas' story is that for 50 years, none of those children 
that he had rescued from certain destruction, none of them knew anything at all about the man who had been responsible for their rescue. Finally, a lifetime later, in 1988, his wife was cleaning the attic and she found in a box an old scrapbook where Nicholas had kept his wartime correspondence along with the names and the photographs of all those children he had been able to save. Nicholas had never really talked about it, even to his wife, because in his mind he just felt like he was doing what anybody else would do if they were given the chance to save a life. And that scrapbook finally made its way into the hands of Esther Ranson, who was host of a BBC program called That's Life. And Esther invited Nicholas Winton, now an older gentleman, she invited him to the taping of that Sunday night program without telling him exactly why he was there. And that's what led to this very emotional moment in 1988, a full half century after Nicholas made his choice to make a difference with his one and only life. This is his scrapbook. There are all kinds of fascinating pictures in it. Perhaps you can see, this is a picture of Nicholas Winton himself with one of the children he rescued. If you look at the very back of this scrapbook, fascinating things in it, all the letters. But back here is the list of all the children. This is Vera Diamant, now Vera Gissing. We did find her name on his list. Vera Gissing is with us here tonight. Hello, Vera. And uh, I should tell you that you are actually sitting next to Nicholas Winton. I wore this around my neck, and this is the actual pass that we were given to come to England. And I'm another of the children that you saved. Can I ask, is there anyone in our audience tonight who owes their life to Nicholas Winton? If so, could you stand up, please? Winton hadn't organized those trains, I would have probably died. Here I am with 668 other children that represent the lives that he had saved.
of the six million Jews that perished in the Holocaust, over one million of them were children. It was so unthinkable that as the Second World War drew to a close, the Nazis attempted to destroy all the evidence and all the witnesses to their crimes. Those evil efforts, along with the sheer scale of these murders, meant that to this day the exact number of their victims will never be known. But there is one number that we know for sure. We know that 669 children escaped on the trains from Prague because of one man, one life, Nicholas Winton. Because of his one life, because he didn't sit back or sit by, but he got involved because of that one life, there are almost 6,000 people alive today. We all know people who try to get us involved in a cause. They plague us with their earnestness and their single-mindedness and their laser focus. How many checks have been written just to get somebody to leave us alone? But you see, Nicholas Winton wasn't asking for money. He was asking for much, much more. He asked people to upend their lives in order to save children when nobody else even cared enough to try. All across the world, people did what most of us do. They turned the page of the newspaper. They took another sip of coffee. They shook their heads at the tragedy, and they did nothing. They knew about the impending fate of the Jews, yet they continued to live their lives, go to work, take care of their families, and sleep in peace. They did nothing because they simply wouldn't stir themselves to act. They were like the masses today who write, quote, thoughts and prayers on social media platforms everywhere and then never give that cause or that person a second thought. Nicholas Winton saved six thousand lives because he cared enough to act. He didn't make a big deal out of it. He didn't need for people to know his name or what he had done. And he said multiple times in later years, he didn't think he was a hero. He just did what he could. And this is what impacted me so much over the last couple of weeks in reading this story and in reading interviews and in looking at pictures and video clips. His great reward, 50 years later, was looking into the smiling, tearful faces of people who lived because he had lived. Now, there's a much bigger conflict than the Second World War. And it has a much more wicked enemy. And there are many more lives at risk. We live in the final generation of the battle for the souls of men and of women. They have been marked for eternal extinction by Satan. And all around the church world, people like you and me, we've come to know that shocking truth. We've heard the words heaven and hell. We've heard the words God and Satan. We've heard the words salvation. We know this shocking truth. We know that eternity is too wrong, too long to be wrong. And eternity is filled with unbelievable beauty for the people of God and unbelievable torment for the people who do not know God. The Bible still calls them the sinners. They're not sinners because they're bad, evil, and wicked. They're sinners because they have no Savior to wash away their sins. All around the church world, people have come to know the shocking truth 
about eternity. And in Christian homes all across the world, most people do what most of us do. They turn the page of the newspaper, they take another sip of coffee, they shake their heads at the tragedy of it all, and they do nothing. I don't come to scold or berate you tonight. I come to be transparent with you. I want my one life to matter. When I get to heaven, we sing about it, we preach about it, we rejoice about it. But when I get to heaven, I don't just want to see my loved ones and my friends. I also want to look into the smiling, tearful faces of people who are there because I was here. We all know people who try to get us involved in a cause, and we all know pastors who try to get us involved in a cause. They plague us with their earnestness and their single-mindedness and their laser focus. How many missions checks have been written just to get them to leave us alone? But this pastor on this pastoral team, on this night in this service. I'm not asking for money. I'm not asking for an offering. I'm asking for much, much more at the beginning of the year 2023. I'm asking you to be willing to upend your life a little bit in order to follow the lead of pastor and get involved in kingdom rescue work. I'm asking you to upend your life and your comfort zone just a little bit in order to be a witness, to touch a life, or to save a soul. I already know, I've been a pastor for four decades, I already know that most church people will just turn the page of the newspaper, take another sip of coffee, shake their heads at the tragedy of it all, and do nothing even though they know about the impending fate of eternal souls, they will just continue to live their lives, go to work, take care of their families, and sleep in peace. They will do nothing. Not because they can't, but because they don't care. They will be glad. They'll be the first to volunteer to attend a service or watch a webcast or like a post or pray a prayer or keep the rules or write a check but they'll never give the real cause a second thought. You say, oh, Pastor Raymond, you've just got the new year thing going. No, it's not the new year. It's not at all. I'm at an age where I'm much more retrospective than I have ever been before. And when I look back over my life, I can't speak for you. I find myself constantly wishing that I had done more. Yes, I have worked long and hard. To the best of my ability, I have been diligent and conscientious and sacrificial. I think I fought a good fight. I want to finish my course. I know I've kept the faith, and I hope there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness. But even though I have had the privilege of a lifetime, full-time vocation in the apostolic church. If I could just be honest with you, that's not enough for me. At the end of the journey, people have been kind. I've had lots of privileges and honors, more than I deserve. But at the end of the journey, I just want my one life to count. When I get to heaven, I don't want to just see my loved ones and my friends. I also want to look into the smiling, tearful faces of people who are there because I was here. Watching that setting, I've watched it I don't know how many dozen times over the last couple of weeks. It always does this to me because I can only imagine the joy in Nicholas Winton's heart when he turned around 
in that studio and looked at all those people, many we couldn't even see in the camera shot, people that were there because he lived and because he got involved. My missionary friends, I love them all. They bug me. They convict me. They have wrecked me for business as usual and church as usual and life as usual because so many of them, they just don't live for the temporal. They live for the eternal. I can't do what they do and I'm not called to go where they go. But God help me, I can do something to affect someone. And that's something, and here's the key for all of us Pentecostal people. That something isn't just writing a check or praying a prayer and then forgetting it until next time around. No, that something is investing my life and upending my comfort because whoever saves one life saves the world entire. One soul is worth the entire world. And it all starts with my one life touching their one life. The little scrap of paper was clumsily taped to the bottom corner of a cheap mirror in the tiny bedroom of the humble house on the busy street in Manaus, Brazil, when I stayed there in 2014. It contained just one scripture verse that obviously meant a lot to my missionary friends, Benny and Teresa de Merchant. It's a verse they loved, but it's not just a verse they loved, it's a verse they lived. And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament. And they that turn many to righteousness will shine as the stars forever and ever. You will scarcely believe it, but I'm finished. Except to say this, I want to live that verse. And I have just one life to do it. Someday in heaven, brothers and sisters, I hope to see all of you there. I want to rejoice with you around the throne. I do want to see my loved ones and our friends who have gone before us. But there's an ache in my soul. I want someone to turn to me and say, like that lady said to Nicholas Winton, I'm one of the people you saved. And then my living will not have been in vain. Paul said, for what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? What are we going to get happy about? What are we really going to rejoice about in heaven? Do we really think after a lifetime spent serving Jesus and talking about how none of the material things in this world matter? Do we really think after a lifetime of preaching and singing and believing those words that suddenly we're going to get to heaven and we're going to spend eternity rejoicing over how beautiful the gold is and how beautiful the, the gates of pearl are and how beautiful the walls of Jack? Do we really think that? We're not going to spend eternity rejoicing over that. We're going to spend eternity rejoicing over being in the presence of Jesus with everyone else who has been saved from the wrath that is going to fall on this earth. And we are closer to that eventuality than ever before. Paul said, what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? Now, this is King James, so I'll turn it in a second. Are not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? Paul said, let me tell you what I'm going to rejoice over in that day. Let me tell you what my great joy will be the second I get into heaven and my feet hit those streets of gold. It's going to be you. It's going to be all of the people that I had a chance to talk to about Jesus, that I had a chance to preach the gospel to, that I had a chance to bring along with me my joy joy on that day is going to be you. Yes, we're going to rejoice to see our loved ones, 
But can I just say, we already know they're there. They're safe. They already made it out. They already escaped. They're already good. So it'll be wonderful to see them again. As this church knows, I've got a wonderful dad who is now in heaven. I'll be traveling. I'll be in the hotel rooms alone an awful lot of the time. And uh, every once in a while, I still catch myself doing it. Did it the other week. They had an old guy like me preaching a youth convention in Tennessee. Go figure that one. I was just in the hotel room alone and every once in a while I'll just catch myself saying, Jesus, I miss my dad. And I do. But he already made it. I want to see him again. But the whole reason we have a hope it's because somebody brought the gospel to us. And the weight of that, while it may not fall on so many people because they'll just flip the page of the newspaper, drink another sip of coffee, shake their head at the tragedy of a lost world and all this darkness, and they'll just carry on making money and carry on doing their stuff. But can you feel the weight of eternity at the beginning of another beautiful year. You know why pastor has us praying and fasting? It's not just so we can have more exciting services. It's so we can become sensitive to what God is speaking to his church. I don't know everything God's going to speak to this church this year. That's not my primary responsibility anymore, but I'm with pastor in feeling after God. But I know one thing God's gonna speak to this church, not just this year, but every time we're together, there's going to be the desire of God hanging over this great group of people. Because if you've been saved from sin by the power of the Lord Jesus, then I owe a debt to somebody else that doesn't know this yet. And you can feel the weight of eternity that rests over us. Would you lift up your voice, not in worship, but in prayer right now? Because even this simple little story and this simple little sermon tonight is tugging at the corner of your heart right now. You can resist it. You can drown it out with something else. You can check your phone right now and you can probably shake off conviction for another moment or two. But if your heart is sensitive to the presence and the power of God, to the leading of his spirit and his voice, you will feel something pulling at you. It's going to take us a moment in the spirit to catch up here. So just keep praying. Just people of God filled with his spirit. You're beautiful. Just keep praying. We've had some intercessors go on to glory this year. And we've got a few that are missing tonight. I need some other intercessors to stand in the gap and begin to lift up your voice and pray. Sore batre bolo tre behesia sab. Sore bato rabasio sabate kiosa. Elo to re bato re behesia sab abukote ba. Ore talabusia sab. Beto rotare bosh. 
there's a powerful undercurrent of the Spirit here. This is the kickoff to the week of prayer and fasting that Pastor and the Lord have called us to. So why don't you just embrace that and push yourself into prayer. Just let yourself go into prayer because God's going to talk to you this week. If you're here in this service tonight and you've never had the privilege of being baptized in Jesus' name for the remission of your sins, you've never had the privilege of receiving his spirit, we exist for you, we live for you, we live for that. And so don't feel like this service just kind of went around you and talked to somebody else but I would like this great church to stand to your feet right now. And as you do, I'd like you not to begin to fellowship or get ready to do something different. I'd like you to just push yourself into the realm of prayer. There is a realm of prayer that God is calling us into in a special way this week. Deep calleth unto deep. I believe there are many in this room that you feel like you'd like to join us at the altar tonight. Maybe I'm misreading that, but I think there are many here that you'd like to come on this first Sunday night of this new year and and you'd like to begin to to pray. We we had a, a, a wonderful week, this first week of 2023, but it's time to push into this year. Would you join us at the front right now? When you get here, don't just bury your head. Just lift up your head and begin to pray. Let Jesus talk to you. Let Jesus talk to you. I'm not looking for the twos and the threes. I'm looking for somebody in this great church that can shake yourself out of the normal. Shake yourself out of the average. Shake yourself out of the routine. Shake yourself out of the same old, same old. Shake yourself out of the tyranny of work every day and jobs and priorities every night and and let your one life, let it matter. Let it matter for the kingdom. Let it matter for the kingdom. I'm not saying you've never been concerned that you've never been involved I'm just saying that there's more to do there's more to do We're not going to sing off the conviction right now. We're going to pray. But it upends my life, Pastor Raymond, if I live like this. That's precisely the point. It upends your life. Oh, <laughs>
That was the first wave of response in prayer. Now back up and take a breath in the spirit and let God lead you into the second wave of, of prayer in this room tonight. There's another powerful wave of prayer and intercession that wants to grip the people of God. Just reach over and grab somebody's hand and, and pray with them, pray beside them, pray, pray the same kind of prayers that they're praying. Doesn't matter who it is. Just pray together as a church family, as a church body. Oh, there's such a release of the Spirit when we get our heart attuned to the heart of God, when we get our lives attuned to what He sent us here, what He commissioned us to do. There's such a release. All of the other stuff that you're dealing with, it becomes so little when you get your mind focused on the priority of God and the priority of his kingdom. Oh, yes, Jesus. Don't resist that burden of prayer. That's a beautiful burden. That's a beautiful thing. It's like a blanket of intercession. It's going to carry you and lead you and guide you through this week as you fast and pray. There's going to be the real priorities of the kingdom that are going to come on you for this year. <laughs> So to tarabo sheba botura katala bosa e do lo tarebe hete ki shaba e do rite la 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 bosha saba bako saba e botura basia sama monto ko saba yes jesus oh yes jesus Thank you for your beautiful people. Thank you for your beautiful people. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I'm going to turn this back to Pastor in a moment to give us whatever direction he has for this week. And, but there's one more wave of prayer. Would you just, in your spirit, just take like a deep breath of the Holy Ghost and get your voice ready and get your heart ready and get your words ready. Would you just take a deep breath of the Holy Ghost and would you just let a third wave of prayer, that's the only way I know how to describe it, just let that just wash across this congregation. God's birthing some callings 
in the lives and the hearts of people. God's birthing some callings in young people in a, in a very self-centered generation, but they're going to stand up and be different and stand up and be counted and stand up and be involved. But it's not just for the young, it's for all of us. It's for everyone. It's beautiful, church. You remember if you were here Wednesday night when Zion travails, sometimes in prayer, you've got to push a little bit. So would you just push in the spirit for a moment? God's setting us up for a powerful week of hearing from him in prayer. This is his heart. It must be our heart. This is his purpose. It must be our purpose. Oh, I worship you, Jesus. Oh, I worship you, Jesus. Oh, I worship you, Jesus. Oh, I worship you, Jesus.